children. Uncle Charles here with another Dread Time story for you. Are we all tucked up comfortably, feet up and under the covers away from whatever lurks beneath the bed? Excellent. Then we'll begin. And tonight's tale is entitled Spare Parts by Jason Narang. Awareness creeps in through my eyelids with the bright light of the fluorescence. Pain throbs through me despite the numbness of painkillers and lingering anaesthetic. The smell of bleach and antiseptic makes my nose twitch. My toes are cold. I wiggle them carefully as though they might shatter. The movement is like small needles of pain. But I can't help smiling. Smiling so uncontrollably wide it threatens to split my head in two. I'm alive. I have my clone to thank. It lies nearby, staring at the ceiling, surrounded by tubes and monitors. If I could move, I'd walk over and hug it. Instead, I lie back on my I lie on my back, marvelling at my survival. I thought I was dead from the moment I hit the ground. No, even before that, from the moment the thug came up behind me on the footpath outside the family home. The instant I felt him grab me from behind, his stale breath jetting past my face as he told me, Don't worry, sport. This won't hurt a bit. Liar. Every stab was agony until the shock set in, but I was on the ground by then, staring at the front gate, capable only of moving one hand, fingertips scraping raw on the tarmac, as though I could pull myself to the intercom and summon help. Dying on the sidewalk, suddenly sober, stone-cold sober. Should have been stone-cold dead, but people came, I remember that. Father's guards, father, then mother. Both of my parents dressed as though just returned from a casual night out, in slacks and cashmere sweaters. Mother wore only a few of her rings, which glittered as she held them before her face to mask her shock. I remember feeling dirty, of all things. Not afraid, not angry, but dirty at having my parents watch me bleed to death on their own doorstep. Even now, with the cold of the steel gurney seeping into my flesh, I still feel dirty. I shut my eyes as, the, as though by doing so, I can vanquish the memory of their faces. Not quite surprised, more like profoundly disappointed, as though they both had suspected it would come to this sometime, just not this close to home. More likely a casino somewhere, or a yacht, or a brothel. Disappointment is a look I have come to recognise, but it has never cut me so deeply before. The early victorious smirk fades. We're awake. I snap open. A frightened gulp burns my throat. I relax as a nurse leans over into my field of vision. Her blouse opens to reveal a patch of white bra, soft swell of breast. I look away, but catch her glare. I close my eyes again, trying to block out a flood of memories. Parasitic friends, easily impressed women, fancy parties, all rendered equally dull by booze and drugs. Christ, no more. I'm embarrassed. I try to look her square in the eyes, but she concentrates on attaching electrodes to my scalp. I want her to know I'm not like that, not anymore. Can never be again. Nearly dying does that to you. Suddenly I want to shout, to punch the air, flick my would-be killer, the bird. But my body, weighed down by drugs and ordeal, won't respond. Relax, the nurse says, her voice firm. You're safe now. The monitors will keep an eye on you. Our eyes meet and I smile, nod my thanks. My eyes stay focused on hers. I'm going to put an oxygen mask on you, help you breathe, okay? Her voice is softer, her touch more gentle. I take it as a small reward that she doesn't hold that glimpse against me, that she understands I didn't go back for more, that she understands I feel good, better, almost clean. Don't try to talk, the anaesthetic numbs the vocal cords and it takes a while to wear off. She squeezes my shoulder reassuringly and attaches the mask. A cold rush of O2 makes me dizzy. Or maybe it's just the realisation that I've been given a second chance. She looks across me, to the clone, back to me. Do you know where you are? she asks. You were very lucky you were found so quickly. You were cut up so badly they had to give you a new liver. I nod. My father has the best health insurance money can buy, though God knows I've done nothing to deserve it. My clone still stares at the ceiling, giving no sign it knows we're in the room. The nurse moves around the head of the bed, blocking my view as she finishes with the electrodes, and checks my sheet is tucked firmly around my neck. She moves to check a machine, and I see it, the clone, looking at me. Something icy passes over the back of my neck. My entire body breaks into goose pimples. It's like looking into a mirror. Even our sheets are identical. 
I turn my head, shivering, but can't help feeling sorry for it. Probably bought out of hibernation the moment the alarm was raised. Rushed into a stasis fat to be prepared for the transplant. Never learning to talk, never uttering a word. It has rarely been conscious. It's easier that way. Avoids complications. Of course, once it's frozen, it becomes academic, poor thing. Spending all its youth in the colourless gunk of a vat to be stored away when it reached its optimum physical condition in case I needed it. And I had needed it once before. When I was a child and fell through a railing at the family mansion, crashing to the driveway below, they transplanted the left arm from the clone. Such was the damage to mine. Makes me ache just to think of it. The memory is as fresh as the day it happened. I thought I was going to die then too. But thanks to the clone, I got a new arm. The clone wasn't able to regrow an arm. Organs and tissue they can do, but whole limbs and joints are still too advanced. Now the clone has been rolled out again, this time to provide a liver to replace the one mutilated by my attacker. I remember hearing someone theorising about some pissed off boyfriend or father or some creditor. Maybe it was the cops doing the mumbling or maybe my parents. I've given them plenty of cause over the years. The old saying about not knowing what you've got until you lose it rings in my ears. It's only now I realise how lucky I am. Father has spent his entire life building up the company. He won't let a little thing like an accident stop his son from collecting, even though his son has so far proven unworthy. But that's going to change. There, this is, there is time to make up for my selfishness. I can return to university and, and do some work this time, maybe do a business degree, honours even. Yes, I, I can make them proud, justify their patience and expense, erase that memory of their faces looking down at their bleeding son. Someone saying, hurry before it's too late. My sentiments exactly. I've got so much to do. I'm already planning which university to enrol in when I hear my parents' voices and have to fight the urge to call out. Over here! I'm alive! I'm better! A machine pings louder as my excitement pumps up my heart rate. I try to rise, but again I can't. Pressure across my ankles and waist suggests I've been belted in to stop me rolling off the gurney. I groan inwardly, at least as my battered body protests against the sudden movement. My father sounds old and tired. He is close to retirement age. Maybe hearing I've decided to take my place in the company will ease his mind, let him enjoy his twilight years. The thought of the two of us bent over paperwork on the dark wooden table in his study brings tears to my eyes. How's our boy? My mother asks, and I see them enter the room with a couple of white-coated doctors. Doing well, one of them says, clipboard in hand. He has taken the transplant well. This is an amazing moment, Doctor, getting our boy back like this. Mother sounds overawed, her regal tone seeming almost to echo off the plain white walls. It was all a bit of a rush, but we think it's gone according to plan. When does the other one go back in the tank, Father asks, a frosty edge to his voice. It might be relief or perhaps discomfort at seeing me in such a state. Don't worry, Father, just wait till you see me in cap and gown on graduation day. I grin behind my mask, trying to remember the last time I saw him smile. Soon, the doctor says. Don't want to keep him on the artificial liver too long. Transplant's still a delicate operation, says another doctor. We'll go, he'll go into cryogenic storage once we're sure everything's working properly. I can't help another rush of sympathy for the clone. Now down a liver as well as an arm. I wonder briefly if they'll keep the clone in stasis while they culture the new liver, or freeze him and eat, and eat separately. Not my concern, really. I need to speak to my parents to say I'm sorry, to thank them. God... I want to hug them so badly. Tears blur their outline. I wish they'd come closer. Maybe I can make them hear my whisper. My vow to make them proud. You understand, the doctor says, that this attack has accelerated the schedule, don't you? This fellow has only been active for a few months. His learning is still very basic. What? What the hell does that mean? Can't be any worse than the first ones, Mother says, voice as hard and sharp as a scalpel, slicing straight through me. At least we won't have to wait for him to grow up before we know if he's a wastrel. A wastrel? The machine's beeping keeps pace with my pounding heart. The nurse moves at the centre of my vision, but I'm fixated on my parents, trying to understand what the fuck they're talking about. Father mumbles. He came home unexpectedly. Looking for another handout, no doubt, Mother says. No, no, my God, no! I struggle against the bindings. The gurney rattles. Machines screech. Silent screams rip at my throat. My face flushes hot. The nurse tries to hold me down. The sheet slips. I see my left arm.
the bandage, the stump, the meat inside. They wheel the vat to the foot of my gurney. Father walks over to the clone and squeezes its shoulder. I scream and scream soundlessly. The nurse increases my dosage. The last thing I see is my mother, hand in hand with father, whispering, You see, darling, I told you this wouldn't hurt a bit. And she looks at me, smiling sweetly. Good night.